From physician to shamanistic healer, Dr. Sarah Seidelman was, as she put it in her book, Born to Freak. She's her own personal change artist and the high priestess of change to others and loves to ask, how good are you willing to get? We'll talk with her next on Speak Your Mind. Welcome to Speak Your Mind. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps, licensed psychologist with the Human Development Center. Quiz time. Now, have you ever felt like you didn't fit in? Check mark here. Ever wonder what's stopping you from being your best ever you? Ever wondering if you're following your true calling? Well, if you answered yes to any of these questions, you're going to love my guest tonight, or at least feel a certain cosmic connection with her. She's felt all of those things, and she's still figured out how to follow her feel good. And the best part, she's here to give us a few tips on how to do that for ourselves. How great is that? If you want to expand your awesomeness, then this is the show for you. Our phone lines are open for your questions so you can take your life to the next level. Call the numbers on your screen locally, dial 218-788-2844, or call toll-free at one 877-307-8762. We'll be answering your questions throughout the show. My guest tonight is Dr. Sarah Seidelman, a fourth generation physician turned shamanic healer who's changed her life by changing her mind and a few other things. And now she helps others to do the same. She's the author of What the Walrus Knows and Born to Freak. Thank you so much, Sarah, for coming here tonight. I appreciate it so much. I am so happy to be here, Carolyn. Thank you and for having here, me. Here are the books. Here are the books. Here's What the Walrus Knows. And both of these books, I've, I've actually read both of these books, and they're wonderful. This talks kind of more about her shamanic healing practice type involvement with the spirits, which, which she'll tell us more about. And this one, this is my personal favorite, Born to Freak, and she's gonna tell us a little bit about what that means. And I think that's a really good place to start because I know that there are a lot of people out there who cringe when they hear the word freak because number one, that has been used by a lot of people meanly towards others. And that's yes. not at all the spirit that you mean it in. No, I mean it in the spirit of born to freak. So people who are born to freak are essentially um, people who are born to come to this world and to bring balance and healing to the world by expressing their oftentimes strange and eccentric inner multitudes. And so sometimes like, for example, I was a pathologist or my practice, I was a, a physician in practice there are other parts of me that um, maybe don't fit in with medicine. Like I like to do decoupage, I like to do interior design. I mean, I have all these different passions and it's really through expressing all those inner multitudes um, that we can really bring balance to the world. And so that's kind of, that's the, the spirit of the book. And I just wanted to encourage people to sort of get their freak on in the best sort of way. In the best sort of way. Yeah. And, and I feel like, you know, I want to say that that book really res resonated with me as a figure skating psychologist. So. Right? There you go, yes. Uh, yes, so I, I am one of your kindred freaks then. You are, yes, it's the most excellent. <laughs> the, um, now, you, I, I said that you, you were sort of this agent of change and you've done some changing, a, a little bit of changing yourself. Yes. You know, you had, you had the life that many people dream of and then you said, I think I'll change everything about that. Yes, I was in practice of medicine and I loved it for a good long time, but then there came a period about probably seven or eight years ago, I started feeling kind of overwhelmed. We have four kids and there was a lot going on in our world, but also at work I started feeling less, um, less passionate about what I was doing and more curious about, so in pathology we make the diagnosis, we're the persons who are very focused on disease and diagnosis. and. I started wondering, you know, what would happen if we started, you know, if we looked at how could we bring health? You know, that just started to be a question that was always running through my mind. And eventually ended up taking a sabbatical from work and that sabbatical just changed everything for me. So um, taking that space away from the office and away from that um, allowed me to take some time to spend wandering around in nature sort of aimlessly. And aimless is a very good thing for finding, kind of reconnecting to yourself and, and what you're, but I like to say, you know, your soul is really asking you or calling you to do. 
and in my case, it was to really just completely change my career. Um, and so eventually, I, I was wandering in the woods. I didn't just wander in the woods completely, but um, I did a lot of that. And in that, I really started connecting to nature, uh, just feeling much better out there. And I think everybody who spends time, I know in Duluth, we're all, a lot of us are outdoors people, and we know how fabulous we feel. You can be in a bad mood and you go outside and go snowshoeing and you come back feeling like a million bucks. I mean, so spending all that time made me really feel um, good. And then I started sort of connecting to other I strange ideas like animal totems, which completely changed my life. When I learned about animal totems, I'm like, so animal totems is the idea that, you know, an animal, and a that's wild really, animal. That's really what you talk a lot about in the book, yeah. what the walrus knows. Yeah. And so it's, the, it's an ancient indigenous and, you know, kind of global concept that, the wild animals that cross our path may have significant meaning and messages for our lives. And I was like, that sounds like crazy. But you know, coming from medicine, I was like, how could that? But once I started exploring it, I was like, well, I'll be darned. I think I'm getting some powerful messages. And it really, noticing what animals cross my path, I know that sounds kind of wild, but that really started to shift things for me. And that's how you get into from um, uh, Dr. Sarah Seidelman, pathologist, to Dr. Sarah Seidelman, shamanistic healer. Yes. I kind of had to call the guys at work and go, you know what, I don't think I'm coming back from the sabbatical because, you know, the wild animals are giving me messages. I never really said that to them, but I kind of wanted to. But Yeah. And um, and shamanic healing is really, it goes it takes the animal totem thing and really, it goes a little deeper than that because as I wander down that path, I that, that, that are actual, there are spirits that are associated with these animals and many of them volunteer themselves to come and help give healing to people and so that's what I do now. You know and, and you talk in you talk in in both books about that healing of the soul and I think we we talk a lot um, about healing the body um, we talk I talk a lot obviously about healing the mind but talk a little bit about just how important because I think you, you know if we're not if we're also not feeding our soul and healing our soul um, then, then we're missing a big we're missing a big part. Yeah. So the concept in shamanism is that when we were conceived and we come to the earth, we're this beautiful ball of golden light. Your soul is completely intact. But over time, your soul parts of it can be lost. It could even be in when you're in utero in your mother's you know womb um, up to um, all throughout your life. So different experiences, traumatic experiences, surgery. Um, even being in a room when somebody's very angry and throwing a lot of anger around the room, you might not even know this person, but those things can cause part of our soul to flee away just because it doesn't want to tolerate that. And what shamanism does, or what a shamanic practitioner does, is restores those parts of the soul back to the person, um, which sounds like a very unusual concept, but shamans believe that you know most of the illnesses, physical illnesses that are in the world now are caused from soul loss. And so when we have all of our soul, when we're completely 100% and that's sort of our life force, there's really nothing that we can't do. You know, we're, we can do the things that we have been put here to do and to create and, you know, expand and grow, write books, whatever it is. And so part of this is really, to me, I, I think about, you know, people not knowing themselves and that it, that it's going to be hard to be connected to your soul or experience that soul wholeness maybe if you are constantly in a state of not knowing yourself, not, not, not getting to know yourself. Yeah. And you talk also about that in the book, Born to Freak. And let's talk a little bit about how you see that people can, um, can come to know themselves and not be so afraid of that. Yeah, well, and what happens, you know, when we're in our, as children in school, we begin to learn we need to behave a certain way. We need, you know, certain people want certain things for us, from us, behaviors, the way we act. And by the time you're 30 or 40, there's a lot of rules about who you are supposed to be, who people want you to be. And I think, um, so there's a couple, I mean, there's so many tools for getting to know yourself. Um, one of the tools I love that I use with my coaching client is Strengths Finder 2.0, which is this wonderful book where you, you know, discover what your strengths are. A really simple way, though, is to ask friends and family, hey, tell me about what you get about being around me. What happens, you know, when you spend time with me, how do you feel? What do you think my strengths are? And that can be really a vulnerable thing to do to ask, but it's really surprising and wonderful to see. And I've done that with circles of friends, and it's just such a sweet practice to do because you discover 
we always don't we don't always have the best perspective of ourselves but what other people can see in us um, when we connect with that we can go oh and we can often think wow I didn't I didn't know that about myself you know so you were talking about we grow up with all of these rules and and one of those rules is not go to medical school um, incur um, oodles and oodles of debt from paying for medical school and then say oh I, I think I chose wrongly here so one of the things I want how did you get the bravery and courage? Where did that come from to do that? Because this is major role model, major role model for people who feel like I'm stuck and I can't, I can't get out of uh, where I am because I have to do these things. Yeah. Well, what I did first was, and I always encourage people if they're feeling like I've got to quit my job or I need to move to Missoula, Montana to be happy, like. Just hold on. Don't do anything drastic at first. You know, find ways to um, to to get happy where you are without changing a lot of your circumstances. Um, and you can do, you know, with a coach, a therapist. You know, spending more time with people who love you. Those things can really help with that. Um, but for me, what happened was, yeah, I took this sabbatical. And as the more I was spending time in the woods, and the more I was sort of learning more about shamanism and and coaching work, also. I just started realizing secretly, which I didn't confess to too many people, I really don't think I can go back to medicine. This is like so much fun and I'm so much in my sweet spot. I, I really, um, it was hard for me to admit, um, but I finally did uh, admit was, it. Was the thought hard for you to even have yourself? It was, it was scary. And I think, you know, what it really came down to was like, how good was I willing to let it get? Because one thing that happened that summer, I said, you know, universe, if I'm meant to like not go back to medicine, please give me a sign. And that summer, like a month later, my husband got a raise to the exact amount of the part-time salary that I was earning. And what was interesting about that, though, Carolyn, is that I was like, yay, this is so great. But within a week, I was already back like, well, I don't know if that means. I don't know. And I really started doubting. And what I, when I dug deep, I recognized I didn't really truly believe that I deserved to have a great life, enjoy the work I do, you know, and not have to worry about things. You know, it was sort of, and that's why I love to ask that question, how good are you willing to let it get? Because I believe when we ask for things, um, you know, they, they're often given to us. And, and you also talk about, though, what, what you were just saying about not, not believing that you actually deserved to give that gift to yourself. You talk about the glass ceilings that we impose yeah. upon ourselves. Yeah. And that that don't let you grow beyond then a certain point. Exactly. Yeah, there's just, it's sort of this, um, Gay Hendricks calls it the upper limit factor, and I think it's so great. And really all of us have them, you know, it's like, I'm not willing, to, you know, I, I don't deserve this much love and affection. I don't deserve this much money. I don't deserve this much security, or I don't deserve to, you know, fill in the blank, go on a vacation or whatever it is. Um, uh, and so it's really just getting in touch with that and kind of spending some time working on self-love. I mean, and, and there's a lot of practices out there for that, but ultimately, when we love and care for ourselves, that's the only way we can really actually be helpful to other people and be really truly loving and caring to our partners, our families, our kids, our you know, friends. And so one of, one of the keys and one of the things that I see that gets in the way of or how people um, are their own worst enemy with respect to change is that, is that idea of this, this whole lack of self-acceptance. Um, yeah. And so you also have another part to you that I know about, yes. which is that you have um, ADHD. Yes. And was there ever a time for you where part of your ADHD sort of interfered with that ability to, to accept who you were? Yeah, for sure. And I got that diagnosis also, consequently, when I was on the sabbatical. And at first, when I received the diagnosis, it was um, a lot of sadness and a lot of grieving and a lot of kind of shame because in our culture, you know, ADHD is kind of like the joke, oh my gosh, this person, you know, people are constantly making comments. And, and there's a lot of people talk about it's not a real diagnosis. There was a lot of shame, but the beauty of that diagnosis for me is that I really started to recognize what my strengths were and that you know my own irrepressibility and my ability to address the elephant in the room and kind of blurt out what I had on my mind. While it could be a, you know, a downside, it had a huge upside and um, my ability to kind of look at a lot of different things and pull one idea, um, kind of to, to take a lot of points of information in and kind of um, create a symphony out of those you know, thoughts and different disparate ideas and be creative with them. Um, 
So getting that diagnosis was um, a huge kind of a gift later on as I, as I kind of was allowing myself to embrace it. Now, how do you think that, that, that your, your ADHD spirit, do you think that that was helpful in your cliff jumping? Because some of what you've done in your life, I, I, I would refer to it as, as cliff jumping. For sure, yes. In fact, there's a whole chapter in Born to Freak about cliff jumping, because some people are like, how could you do this? And I'm like, you know, part of it is that I love to take risks. I mean, it's exciting to me and fun, and I don't always need to know all the information before I leap. Um, but I would say with this, with this particular change, leaving medicine, I took my sweet time. I did not just one day walk in and say, hey, I'm done. You know, it was a very gradual, slow thing. Decision, uh, an intentional decision. Very intentional, yeah. And, and I even had a fire ceremony. I mean, it, it, it went deep, let me tell you. It was not like, hey, I think I'm just going to leave. You know, it, it took some time, so. Now, not everybody who I work with is such the risk taker or fan of risk or fan of change and a lot of people are real change averse and I think you know my experience also is that that we human beings are you know we're, we're, we're madly in love with the status quo um, a little too often sometimes I think and so what do you say to people who are not quite the um, run, run, run faster off the cliff um, yeah well I usually I mean, it depends on where they're at. You know, if people, when people are grieving or they've just gone through something traumatic, I think sometimes we do need that time to just really go inward and take care of ourselves and do nothing and just rest and go into that kind of a cycle. And then there's time when it's time to like, you know, push people out of the nest and it's time to, um, and people know when they get to that point when it's time to take some action and take a chance, like, because it starts to get really uncomfortable sitting where they are. And like for me, sitting in pathology, I mean, the more I would kept going back to work after I knew how free I could feel doing this other work, it was like, whoa, this is hard. It's getting harder and harder to sit here and stare in the microscope. And I think that discomfort, it can either torture you the rest of your life, you can take a chance. Yeah, I talk to people about that's the point where the only thing that's worse than change is not change. And, yeah. you, and you, will feel that in, yes. you will feel that in your gut. And I also say to people, you know, you can change. And if you hate the change, most things we do in life, we can go back yes. to. You yeah. know, if you decided that my new life is so horrible, I bet the world of pathologists would accept Dr. Sarah Seidelman back. Yes, absolutely. And I, I say that to my clients all the time. You can't make a wrong turn, but make a turn. You know, take it, you know, see what happens and then see what your results are. You know, it's sort of this scientific project, your life, you know. Be curious, collect the data. Yeah, collect right? the data. Do, yeah, do the experiment. Mm -hmm. Here is a call. This is a great question from a woman in Duluth. What is the starting point for change? Starting point. Well, usually it's something, I mean, not always, but often it's something kind of catastrophic that causes us completely to melt down. So it can be something like a divorce. Somebody dies. Um, we, all of our kids leave um, and head, you know, or something happens at work that's dramatic. Um, and suddenly our view of ourselves completely changes and the world that we once knew no longer exists, you know. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about the, the term we, we, we use, like the, the catchphrase that we use often is that post-traumatic growth, that, that out, of, out of feeling slayed to the floor, you can, you know, you can rise up and be this beautiful flower that comes out from the ground, right? Yeah, absolutely. With lots of love and support, you know, I think those, when we do, when, when lots of change, you know, comes upon us, then yeah, we often need support and again, lots of love <laughs> to be able to get ourselves up off the floor because sometimes we need a hand up in that process. And, and sometimes I think the starting point to change too can just feel like a tickle in your brain. Yeah, I mean, for me, it felt like this, it was very slow and subtle. It was just like, huh, it just, I'm not getting the same, I'm just not enjoying this as much, or I'm just thinking about this. Everybody, nobody else in the room is feeling the same way. We would sit in cancer conference, and I was like, we were, everybody was so, it seemed so thrilled to be talking about the disease, and I was thinking, does anybody want, you know, wonder what we could, what would happen if we, like, helped this person, like, 10 years ago and helped them connect with family and community and love and connection? How would that have impacted their, their body and their health now? And... I just started feeling that um, that there was something else missing. It was a very subtle thing, but over time that grew. Here's, here's another question from a woman in Duluth who wants to know, what is the very first thing you do when you start an appointment with a client? 
Well, the first thing I do usually is, well, I do, we, everybody has pre-work, and this isn't for shamanic work, but for my coaching work, they do pre-work. Um, so there's some questions to ask. And then the first thing I do is really help people connect into their body. So one of the things I learned is that one of the things we're taught is sort of you know, tough it out, tough through it. You know, your, your body is just like this instrument you're walking around in the world in. But what I learned um, is that our body are the, just like this brilliant, intelligent machine that will tell us so many things. And so I connect people to their body compass and help them to find out where and, you know, what feels good to them and what feels bad. Because when we have, and most of us have had this experience, you know, when we get a twinge or something like, oh, my neck hurts. Often we can tie that back into something that our body was basically screaming no to, <laughs> like, I don't know, saying yes to, you know, baking Christmas cookies for the concert or whatever. You know, we get off the phone and all of a sudden it's like, oh, my neck, you know, and it, our body is constantly whispering to us. So I help people connect to that. That's one of the first things we do. And, you know, I do a lot of work with mindfulness, too, and that mindfulness breathing, which is another connecting to your body yes. and grounding down, right? Grounding down so that you, f you can feel your feet firmly planted on the floor, because if you're about to jump off the cliff, you want to feel your feet on the floor first, and that can yes. kind of give you some courage to then take, then to jump, right? Yeah. To feel the foundation so that you jump, because when you jump up, you can still land still on your feet. Then. Yeah, absolutely. And it just, yeah, you just start to subtly steer yourself. And it's really helping people connect to their own inner compass that knows, your soul knows exactly where it wants to go. And it's sort of just paying attention to that inner guidance. And then I'm just there sort of facilitating it because people know exactly what they need once they connect to that. What do you see are the barriers that people put up for themselves for change? One of the funny things is, I was just talking to somebody about this, is like if we, um, a lot of times people are worried if they're happy and if they pursue their own dreams or their own joyfulness, that somehow that will harm other people in their family or harm you know, pe the people that they care about most. Um, and I always love, there's a video on YouTube that's the, Mary, it's Coach Carter. It's this Marianne Williamson quote, you know, which is like, who are you not to shine? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna botch the quote, but basically the more that we shine our own light, it gives, unconsciously gives everybody around us an opportunity and the um, permission to do that, to shine their own light. So it is the ripple in the universe, right? It's the ripple in the universe. So I think that's the thing we were afraid, like if I do this, it would be a bad thing. If, if I go and be happy, that would somehow hurt somebody else or it's not right for me, I should. Or it would be selfish. Or it would be selfish, yeah. And it's funny because the absolute opposite is true. If you can find joy, you'll become this absolute like beacon of light for everybody around you and, and, and do the things that you truly want to do, be that person that you really want to be. And you know, I, I talk a lot about um, that, that Martin Luther King hope that uh, darkness cannot uh, fight back the darkness, only the light can. And, and that means all of us taking responsibility, personal responsibility for being part of that light. And so that, yeah. that it's not actually a selfish thing. I think it's that when we're giving most back to the universe, yeah. is, is when we have that, that love and that compassion. And, and if we can, we, especially when we can, we can face the, the, the folks who challenge us the most with a sense of compassion and love in our heart. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's just ultimately that feeling good. And that's why I'm, you know, want people to tune into their own feel good, whatever that is, because when we feel good, yeah, it just has this amazing ripple effect. And, and even if people aren't feeling good around us, at least we are, and we're not miserable. <laughs> you know, there you go. How could that be a bad thing? <laughs> not, not a bad thing at all. Right. We are running sh very, very short on time. What is the take home message that you want to leave for our viewing audience? I guess we should have everybody ask, you know, how good are you willing to let it get? You know, how much love and how much um, success and how much fantastic experience are you willing to allow yourself to have in your life? And maybe there's something bubbling up inside of you right now that you know kind of the answer of how you'd like to, how you could start moving in that direction. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful message and a wonderful note for us to end on. Eleanor Roosevelt said, we must do what we feel we cannot do. Isn't she wonderful? I think she was probably one of Sarah's freaks. And I would <laughs> say that this pathologist and shamanistic healer and this figure skating psychologist would agree with Eleanor Roosevelt. Thanks so much for joining the discussion this week. 
don't forget to visit us on the web at speakyourmindonline.org where you can find a schedule of our topics and resource links and read my blog, the place where I'll answer more of your questions. Now, listen up. We're off for the next two weeks due to Thanksgiving and WDSE's December membership drive. And here's the thing, don't be spending every single penny that you have on stupid stuff that people aren't going to want anyway. Save a little bit for public television. You know, the stuff isn't free here and we don't have advertisements. So pony up. Join us for our next show on Thursday, December 11th, when we'll be talking about the challenges caregivers of loved ones with dementia face and resources available for them. I'm Dr. Carolyn Phelps. Thanks for watching and good night.